After 45 years of precarious peace, Indian and Chinese troops clashed in the summer of 2020, leaving 20 Indian soldiers and four Chinese soldiers dead in Ladakh. Nuclear powers facing off in a remote corner of the Himalayas. Chin ne 50 saal mein Bharat ke saath sabse bada vishwas ghat kiya hai, jiski wajah se LAC par galwan khati mein 20 Bharatiya jawan shahid hue. Nam ta ja shoshin yao rinsh dao de yiko shishi na, shi jiko yin jun tiao xin zai xian, tong shi ye shi yue xian zai xian, nam ye shi dong shou zai xian. Following 2020, both sides rapidly began to reinforce their military positions at the border. Both sides have deployed 50 to 60,000 troops on either side of the border. The two sides agreed to disengage from a number of the contentious areas and to establish buffer zones. But with the high number of troops deployed on either side, the situation, as the Indian Army chief put it, is stable but unpredictable. But again, it is not just about the border. As the first Prime Minister of India, Jawaharlal Nehru, put it, it's also a contestation for the dominance of uh, Asia itself. It's not just about the border, but the border becomes only a site of contestation. It goes beyond that. China and India uh, have had a long-standing border dispute uh, ever since the establishment of the People's Republic of China in 1949. This border dispute stretches across pretty treacherous terrain and high altitudes through the Himalayas. And this border dispute has ebbed and flowed over the decades. The trouble started once China militarily occupied Tibet. The buffer zone that existed between China and India vanished. Though India was the first non-communist country to recognize People's Republic of China in 1951, in a decade's time due to the boundary dispute, they went to war in 1962. Now, the 62 war resulted in quite a humiliating defeat uh, for the Indian side. And ever since, India has been deeply distrustful of China and uh, the 1962 war led to a collapse in the bilateral relationship. For the Chinese side, it also left an imprint, um, one that reverberates through decision-making even today. Um, one lesson learned on the Chinese side was that occasional shows of punitive force uh, may be necessary sometimes in order to deter Indian territorial ambitions along the border. In 1988, both the governments decided to de-link the boundary dispute from the overall bilateral relationship and work towards a political solution. But they soon discovered that that was also a very difficult endeavor. The status quo that they tried to clarify was a working boundary that's called the Line of Actual Control, or the LAC for short. India and China don't even agree on the length of the border, whereas India says it is 3,488 kilometers long, China says it's only 2,000 kilometers long. So due to the different perceptions, there are frequent run-ins and clashes between the troops. In the 90s, the two sides signed a number of agreements. These agreements aimed to try to reduce the risks of clashes from spiraling into larger conflicts. But nevertheless, tensions rose again um, starting around 2007 and 2008. After that, there have been many standoffs between the Indian and Chinese troops in 2013, 2014, and uh, the 2017 Doklam standoff that went on for 73 days marked a new low in the relationship. Though the tensions have been brewing since a long time under the leadership of President Xi Jinping and Prime Minister Narendra Modi, whose political reputations are closely linked to sovereign assertiveness and international power projection, they've picked up pace. Prime Minister Narendra Modi, who espouses muscular nationalism, took India back to the pre-1988 framework in its relationship with uh, Beijing. We have also seen that nationalism is on the rise in China and that a lot of what you hear out of China as it becomes more nationalist is that because China has grown stronger, it should be able to have more of a say in the sovereignty disputes compared to when it was weak. Under Prime Minister Narendra Modi, India also shared some of its foreign policy inhibitions and started deepening its security cooperation with the United States and other Western allies. India is playing a bigger role, and China sees all of this as threatening. 
In early May 2020, thousands of Chinese soldiers moved forward along the border in multiple places into areas that China has always claimed as their own, but had never maintained a permanent military presence. And so the scale of this activity has prompted a lot of questions still as to what Chinese motivations were and what their calculations were at the time to have prompted such a bold departure from the status quo. In 2020, China wasn't only facing a more difficult strategic environment, it was also facing issues at home with the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic. And so we know that in that year, Chinese insecurities were particularly high. And so it was likely that they were projecting some of those strategic concerns when they were considering their movements along the border. The jury is still out on what exactly led to the clashes of 2020. One of the most important reasons seems to be India's assertiveness to try and bridge the infrastructure asymmetry on the border with China in the past decade. The Chinese viewed with concern an increase in the number of Indian patrols at the border, a push under the Modi government to build up border infrastructure that then allowed the Indian side to move their troops and military equipment to the border more quickly. Apart from that, uh, in August 2019, New Delhi revoked the special status of Jammu and Kashmir state and reorganized it into two federally run uh, union territories. After revoking the semi-autonomous status of Jammu and Kashmir, New Delhi went ahead and published new map that included Ladakh and Aksai Chin, which is under the control of China. China uh, protested saying it is an affront on Chinese sovereignty and that it is a violation of uh, the border agreements and protocols. China's bet uh, was likely that calibrated controlled escalation would be useful for sending a very clear signal of its resolve to New Delhi and that such a show of force was meant to really shape the calculations of policymakers in India to deter future propagations from the Indian side. But where China appeared to miscalculate was just how far the escalation would go. The 2020 clashes were really a watershed for both the border dispute, but also for the larger bilateral relationship. It was the first time in four decades that there were casualties uh, along the border. And since then, both sides have ramped up the military levels. There are now at least, you know, 50 to 60,000 troops on either side of the border. The Chinese side has also deployed heavy equipment and built up infrastructure and facilities at the border, all of which will cut down the amount of time it takes for China to send reinforcements should something else occur. In December 2022, we saw that clashes erupted in the eastern sector of the border. So the risk of a large conflict is not high, but the potential for smaller clashes to erupt is ever-present. President Xi Jinping failed to attend the G20 summit held in New Delhi, sending out a signal that not all is well with the bilateral relationship. Given that this moment was very important for the Modi government, it also seems to be a sign of low expectations on the part of Beijing of large improvements in the Chinese-Indian relationship going forward. A final risk is, of course, that strategic distrust remains a reality in the relationship. As U.S.-China competition intensifies, both Beijing and Washington consider India's role in that competition to be crucial. That means that the potential for misreading of strategic intent will remain in the China-U.S. relationship and with it, the potential for the border dispute to erupt once more. Since there is no realistic political solution in sight, both India and China should focus on de-escalation and uh, crisis management on the border. For one, the two sides should consider making the buffer zones that they created permanent and also adding ones to additional areas of contention. New Delhi and Beijing should recommit to the previous border protocols including those that ban the use of firearms at the border, publicly signaling to their bureaucracies and to their militaries that these agreements still hold can help to rebuild confidence in them. At the heart of the problem is the lack of clarity as to where the line of actual control lies. The process of LAC clarification that came to a halt in 2002 should be started again. As long as the LAC is not clarified, the soldiers will keep clashing with each other and the escalation is always bound to be a source of risk. And finally, 
The border protocols and agreements that were signed in the 90s and the early 2000s should be updated uh, according to new realities. Given that the border is highly militarized now, the two sides should consider sitting down and discussing what the principle of mutual and equal security means in the current context. But at a very minimum, the two sides should sit down to share their concerns. The informal interaction that used to happen between uh, the heads of state before the Galwan uh, clash of 2020 have come to a standstill and there is an imminent need to restart these informal meetings. It's unlikely that they will reach agreement, but it nevertheless remains important um, for the two sides to be open about their concerns and to talk. China and India will, of course, continue to have a competitive relationship. But what Dialog can achieve is to help the two sides reduce the likelihood of misunderstanding and miscalculation, even as they continue to compete.